I want to talk about this subject, the heart uh, of worship, and the more contemporary uh, story uh, to illustrate this. Well, some of you will recognize the, uh, where I took these words from. Uh, it's from a very contemporary song. Uh, let, let us just read Isaiah chapter 6 first. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6 is the most, uh, I guess in many ways, the most important, uh, most familiar passage in the scriptures about worship. Uh, it's in this, uh, in, this, in this particular passage, we have the words, Holy, Holy, Holy. And then we sing so many hymns have been written from this, uh, from this passage. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the, song, early in the morning, our songs shall rise to thee, and, and so on and so forth. Now, let, let, let's just read. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundation of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal, uh, that, had taken, uh, that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am. Send me. Several years ago, uh, there was a song, a worship leader. At the time, he was uh, also the youth pastor of his church. His name is uh, Matt Redman. Uh, then the, uh, his, uh, they were getting a bit, going through some motion in the worship services. And so Matt's pastor uh, decided to do something quite out of the ordinary. He said, uh, for the next period of our church, church life, uh, we will not have music uh, because uh, he believed music was a kind of distraction through true worship. So no need, no need to have worship from now on. Uh, no drums, no guitar, nothing. No singers, no worship leader, nothing. He says uh, we have to learn how to worship without all this. Uh, so he started to do that. Of course, the musicians were a bit uh, annoyed. Uh, now they got no job in the church. Uh, so there they were some rumblings and people started to come. What would you do if there was no music? So people began to pray. Maybe they murmured something. They didn't know how to... A lot of discomfort at the beginning. Take away the music. Say, what, what do we do? So people, some people began to read the Bible. Some people began to cry to God. And slowly, slowly, they, had a, they brought really worship because people began to repent. There were people kneeling down and, and so on and so forth. And so they began to learn what is true worship. Uh, and then later that the pastor said, okay, I think we learned enough. Let's bring back the, uh, the music because everybody was happy. But in the midst of all this, uh, Matt Redman wrote this song. When the music fades, when all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You are looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Friends, today we, I said just now, whether we have a worship service is uh, dependent on what's in your heart and how you come to God. Uh, music 
if God is only interested in music, He just wire up heaven with a uh, Hosanna music or whatever kind of music, uh, nice CDs and nice singing, and heaven will be plenty of music. But that's not what God is desiring. And from the scriptures, we find worship is not merely about music, because we find that when when Job had all his uh, property taken away, all his family, uh, all his children killed, he lost the family, he lost his property, he lost everything. Bible tells us he arose, tore his robe, and then he shaved his head and he worshipped God. He fell to the ground to worship God. Now, he didn't take out his guitar and start singing. Okay? It was not the occasion, not the time. Uh, but he knew, he recognized. His life is in God's hand. And he will do uh, whatever God wanted. I mentioned that we have a long history, mankind of worship. Uh, today, we, is what we do today is, uh, in all the different religions, uh, is really uh, something through tradition we have learned. Because really, some things we can know about God just from observing the universe. The heavens declare the glory of God, the Bible says. But some things about God we don't really know until we have revelation that God himself began to tell us. And so mankind has been trying to worship God on his own. Uh, then there is the idea that he must sacrifice some things. He must give something to God in worship. And so people give all sorts of things. Uh, today, if you come to Malaysia, you have the Chinese giving pineapples, uh, giving a uh, banana or giving some other thing. And then our Hindu and uh, Indian friends will do some other thing and they give to God. But does God really want all these things? We come to the church and then we have Christians also coming to God and say, God, uh, this is what I can give. Take it or leave it. When we come to worship God, uh, this is an important passage. I want to suggest to you three three ways uh, this morning that your life will be affected if you truly worship God. The first one is true worship is having the eyes to see God. You see, okay, I, I, I just uh, I think some of you uh, wanted to write notes, so I just put it here first. True worship is having the eyes to see God. In verse 6, it says, I saw the Lord. You see, friends, we are all going our happy way, doing our own thing in life. We give Sunday, we come to sing, we get to worship God, we pay our tithes, and, and then the rest of the week, we, we, it's our own. One church member asked the pastor, he said, Pastor, why are you preaching like this? God is, you're always saying God is wanting more and more and more of my life. Then the pastor replied, no, God doesn't want more. He wants all. That's what true worship is. Can you see God in your relationships? Bible tells us we believers should not have relationships with the opposite gender or uh, should not marry unbelievers. But people want to try. Because then they say, I want to serve God, pastor. I will do everything in church. When I marry this, uh, this man, uh, he's not a believer. He told me, he promised me already. I can still come to church. This lady came. He, she, what she means is, I will give God every part of my life except this one. You see, that's the way we are looking. We, when we think of God, we think of our relationships, we think of our job, our career, our business, our family. God is a separate thing. But I want to suggest to you, verse 6, what he's trying to tell us is this. Friends, if you want to worship God, you should see God in every area of your life. What is God in your relationship with every single person in your life? Can you see God there? Eh? What about your business? Is it a time when everything is uh, about you, is a believer, you are a Christian, but when you come into the, enter into the office, you do your business, then God is somewhere else. God is not here. God is welcome to every part of my life except my business. Because I got a man who was uh, obviously had many Christian uh, 
parents and grandparents, but today he is so different. He says, he told me one day, he said, Pastor, you cannot be a, Christ, a businessman and a Christian. You have to choose. I saw the Lord. You know, when I was a young man, I slowly began, God began to, when He saved me, he, person by person, corner by corner of my life, He asked for surrender. He said, can you give this to me? You see, it wasn't all at one time. But as I begin, I want to, God, God, I want to worship you. And sometimes I close my eyes and I raise my hands in worship. Then God put something in my mind. See, this one needs to settle. That one needs to settle. So what do we do? We try to say, oh, this is not God. Maybe some, some vision, some ray, some laser coming from heaven, but it's meant for the pillar behind. I just stood in the way, you know? Yeah? You know that's what sometimes we try to excuse all sort of things. We say, it's not really God speaking to me. But you see, friends, God wants all. Can you see in worship? You know, what's the point? You come, we sing the song, we go home. What's the point? You see, God wants to come, enter into our life. He says, I want all. If you surrender all to me, see what I will do with your life. Sometimes we sing that song, All to Jesus, I Surrender. You sing it here? All to Jesus, I Surrender. 10% I freely give. Huh? Huh? Is that what the song says? All to Him, I freely give. The French translation, someone told me, much more interesting. It says, uh, Instead of all to Jesus, I surrender, uh, the, the meaning when they translate to French comes out this way. Lord, take it all. Lord, take it all. I say, that's a good, uh, that's a good translation. Next time we sing the song, uh, we want to take the offering back and then go around. He say, all to Jesus, I surrender. And then we stand in front of somebody and say, oh, no, that's not all, some more. <laughs> you know, uh, that's not all, you know. Uh, because sometimes the songs we sing, uh, we forget uh, God is listening. Do we really want to sing, I saw the Lord? Secondly, true worship is having the lips to confess. True worship is having the lips to confess. You see, we not only see God in every situation, we say, God, we want you in every situation. Woe is me, verse 5. I am ruined. For a man, well, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The angel took from the altar to touch the lips. Chinese, we always look at a, sometimes very pessimistic. Uh, when some problem comes, we say, ah, yeah, die lah, die lah. You know, we always, quite common with Chinese, say like, oh, die lah, die lah. Like, problem, die then we become Christian, this one don't change you though. Sometimes we say, oh, yeah, die, you know? I say, why you talk like that? God is in charge. Never die. Even die is a resurrection. Don't worry, you know, situation, God is changing. Woe is me. You see, friends, God wants us in our heart to be committed to Him completely. To the extent where God, whatever God do, we will accept. Because God, you are right. That today I don't understand, but I will go along. Because you are God. And that's my worship to you. you no, no point we sing all sorts of things, God, you are God. And then we do different in our life. Verse 6 says, One of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in our hands. Our lips are so important. The Apostle James says, with our tongue we curse God, with our tongue we praise God, you know. Sometimes we, our tongue is uh, such a, our words, our conversation is so important because it reflects what's in our heart. And what is in our heart? As a young man at the age of 32, I was asked, uh, not only just to come out full time, I was asked to go out I believe God asked me, and my church leaders also did, asked me to go to another city to plant, to start the church. 
Uh, it was difficult because uh, I was just 32 years old. I had a young family. My, 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 we had twins. Uh, the twins were only three months old at the time when we were leaving. I uh, should be there, isn't it? Yes. This uh, picture taken 1990 uh, after our first church service, uh, well, after our Christmas service. Uh, you can see there. I don't know whether you can recognize me there. Uh, there was 40 pounds ago. Okay. Uh, I. This is six months after the church started. I just did something. Uh, I went to a city. It's not the place where I was born. I don't know anybody else uh, in the city. And so we had an uh, average about five people every Sunday for the first week, for the first year. It was a terrible time for me. Uh, back in my home church, I was a cell group leader, and there were about 20 people in my house every week uh, for Bible study, for cell group meeting. But now I'm a pastor appointed to start a church, and I only got five people uh, on, the, on the Sunday. Uh, the first year was a terrible time. I wanted to quit. Uh, I cried a lot. I want to go home. I said, God, what are you doing uh, to me? Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the moments I had was this. I, as, a, as an accountant, as a finance controller, I had uh, the company had about 400 people. My, my department, about 20 to 30 people. And then I, I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the person who signed the checks, very important person. But I don't do much. Uh, I don't do all the, I, we have uh, delivery boys, we have all sorts of things. And so those days, we had to go and line up uh, at the post office to pay our bills, our company bills. So I just signed the check, then the, somebody wrote the check. Somebody, uh, I just signed, somebody take the check, somebody line up in the post office uh, to pay the bills. So I'm an uh, important man, I don't do all this. But when I plant, started to plant the church, church only five people, so I had to pay the bills myself. I, took, I, write the, I went to the bank, collect the checkbook, I write the check, I signed the check, and then I went to the post office and I lined up there. One day, just lining up, queuing up, doing what the office boy do. And suddenly down there, I just realized, God, what have you done to me? You know, what have you done to me? In my old job, I got a company car, office driver and all this kind of stuff. I said, what have you done to me? Is this what you want me to do? I, 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 shortly after that, things were going to get worse. Somebody introduced a young man to me, about 15 years old. At the time I was 32, I shared the gospel with him. His family not, not believers, so he went home. He kept, he kept the fact that he became a Christian from his parents. And every week I will see him because his school is next to my house. So I said, "You come over." Uh, he was in the afternoon session, so I asked him to come about 11 a.m. and then we do some Bible study. He had uh, lunch in my house, and then he will go to go to school. His parents didn't know. He kept it from his parents, uh, and we had a uh, building a good relationship. So I was happy God sent me to Sramban maybe to save this boy and disciple him. Then one day, I got a phone call from his mother. Uh, mother found a Bible in his bag. Uh, the mother is a Catholic, but not really, a bit nominal. Father is Buddhist. And so the mother told me, he found a, was very unhappy with the boy. Uh, so the mother said to me, said, Mr. Woon, my husband and I would like to see you uh, before we make a report for indoctrinating a minor. 
You know, at the time, the church very small, five people only. I don't even have a congregation to tell people I'm a pastor, you know. So I call, uh, I call uh, the only other man in the church. I said, uh, can you come with me or not for this appointment? I said, uh, I didn't tell you I was scared, you know. I said, two person better, you know. So I said, okay, I'll come. Then the following week, I remember it was on a Wednesday night. Uh, the appointment was 8 p.m. at night. 7 p.m., this other man calls up from another city. He said, Pastor, I can't come back uh, in time. My meeting, my work meeting is still going on. So I'm afraid you have to go your own. You know, already situation very tense already for me as a young man. Now, the only, I counted on support. I still don't have that. I went to my room, I closed the door. I cried. I said, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? I had a good job. I had respect. When I was serving God in my mother church, my home church, uh, I had a, the company gave me a Volvo. So, the, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big car. And so, that is a company car. And so, I use it when I, I drive it, when I go and fetch the young people to church, you know. So all the, all the parents of the young people very happy one. Uh, were happy with me, uh, taking time to spend with the children. So sometimes I take the, the kids out, uh, we go for camp or whatever. Then the parents usually say, no, 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 I have to ask permission, just go ahead. You know, we're very happy. Of course they're happy, uh, I'm a successful man. But after I decided to come out to serve God, quit my job and do full time, everything changed. Parents say no. He says, uh, Mr. Woon is a dangerous man. The thing was waiting for me. I had to go. So came the time. I went to the house. I listened to the mother, listened to the father. And then I promised, I had to promise, I said, because the law in our country like this. I said, okay, I won't see the boy anymore. I went back. I said, God, what are you doing? I put two, two flags there because I go back to the time when I was called to leave my church to start another church. What made me, how I felt it was God speaking to me was uh, one, one preacher came and he's, uh, he's American spent most of his time in Mexico. They planted 400 churches in Mexico. So he told the story, he said, last time, uh, they say this, the sun never sets on the British flag. Fiji also got a British flag there. And then all over the world, British flag flying at one time in history. Nobody, everybody had a great respect for the Queen and all the things British. And slowly, things change. Britain let go, gave independence. Some country don't want independence to give because they don't want to engage anymore. One time, Britain was called Great Britain. Great Britain. Now some of my English friends tell me, don't call us great. Britain, just Britain. Because now we are no, no longer great. Is this, this, mission, this missionary was telling you, you know why? Why Britain became great? Because people engaged the world. They go, went out. Young men want to go out, waiting to finish school so they can go out. They go to the, they go to the jetty in the after school. They hear all the stories about lands far away for the sailors to come back and they want to go. The parents have to hold them back. Don't go, don't go. Finish your school first. Everybody is looking out. Today, it's not like this. Last time, the colonial department in, uh, in London was the biggest, strongest one. Today, I don't know whether the department still exists. When Britain pulled back, then they got all sorts of problems. Unemployment. And then at that time, uh, we were saying also the Queen may lose her job at one time. People were not happy with the monarchy and so on. China, same story. China was one time very great. Today, of course, uh, China is also quite quite strong. 
But you, when you think of you, at the time when I was uh, experiencing this, China was the poorest country in the world. China rose very fast. Okay, if, if the, the young people probably don't remember a time when China, uh, we go to we, people don't want to go to China. We all my my grandparents emigrated from China. Nobody want to go back. Uh, it's uh, the time it's the poorest country. But China before that one time was very great. You see the Chinese ships come all the way. They came to Malaysia and the, uh, you know big ships, many many ships. The admiral come and and they 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 uh, they, uh the, the our sultan will go to go to Beijing and pay homage and so on. That was in the 1600, 1700, 1500. China great everywhere China went. And then because they experimented with the communism and everything, uh, then. China became very poor. Some point in time, China started to fall already. They, because there was an emperor that came and decided we don't want to engage. They killed all the, camp, all the admirals, they burned all the ships and said we don't want. They, they practiced what, we, they, um, what was called the closed door policy. And once they did that, everybody fight inside China. So many civil war destroyed the country, make it very poor. You see, we have to look out. So that was my encouragement to go out to share the gospel to plant the church i said god if you are god i will do what you say so i went but it was not easy it was after i went all this thing then i came to this uh this conclusion uh you no know, we did uh, by the way we did ee uh as a as a church we were training doing training year after year after year so we had 30 30 over years of ee training in our church so the church has grown uh we have two churches now in the city and then we have, uh, we have sent people out to plant and to pioneer other churches as well. Now, I thought I was the great man. God called me, I'm the great man. I wanted to plant the church. But God had other ideas. God was saying up there in heaven, I want to plant the man. Amen. Sometimes we think God is, a, we don't think in, big enough about God. We think God is, a, we, we, are the big, we are the big shot. God is so fortunate he had me as a Christian. You know? You see, I wanted to plant the church. God wanted to plant the man. God is saying, the message of change, and that's what the gospel is. You tell people God can change your life. The message of change must first change the messenger. And I have to understand again how great God is. God changes the man before he makes him a messenger. I came to the point in my life, I uttered those words. I said, God, whatever you do in my life, Lord, you are absolutely right. And I'm absolutely wrong. I will do whatever you say. Now, no music. It wasn't any musical thing. I didn't even think of putting it to song or anything. It was just a, a, a decision I made in worship. Lord, you are everything. Then thirdly, through worship is having the feet to go. Uh, I think you guys know that uh, this idea, if you read the passage, the idea... It's in the, this is the midst of the worship meeting. All the thunder and lightning and everything. And then God stopped the worship meeting. He said, holy, 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 holy. Who shall be sent? Who will go for us? What is God saying? If you don't go, you're not worshipping. Because going means, carries with it, the idea of surrender. God, wherever you send me, I will go. If I have to die, I will go. And many missionaries die. They go, they don't come back. Look, what is worship? Worship is surrender. In the ancient time, people offer sacrifice. Some people even sacrifice themselves. They sacrifice babies. The, uh, the idea must sacrifice. So God is saying now, yes, idea is correct. The sacrifice is wrong. God don't want all the barbecue people, you know. Because we say sacrifice means something is dead and burned, isn't it? So God doesn't want barbecue Christian. He wants living sacrifice. What does it mean? It means you have a life. 
your own ambition, your own dreams, that's your life. It's dead. You want to worship God, kill it. But don't die. Take your life now, live for God. And now you are there, living sacrifice. Because the old person, we can't recognize, we can't see anymore. It's dead. But you are now saying to God, God, I will do what you say. True worship. And then God says, go. We know he said this. He says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Friends, worship is this. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Of course, uh, that process is just not just going, you know. We have to be prepared to go. We have to be trained and equipped to go. So we tell our church members, Hey, what are you doing today? To prepare to go. God won't call you when you're not ready. So what do you need to do to get ready? Serve God in the church. If you've not joined the EE training, you should be joined the EE training so you can be trained. What's the point going out? You can't do anything. You see? You're serving here. Do something. Teach the Sunday school. Study the Bible. Join the prayer meeting. Join the Bible study. Why? So that one day you can go. Because God is asking, who will we send? Who will go for us? True worship is having the faith to go. Ah, okay. By the way, there are two times faith is mentioned in the New Testament. Both of them related to the gospel. Okay? Uh, this is the uh, first mention in Isaiah. Romans picks this up again. Beautiful feet. You have beautiful feet. Okay? Everybody, we need beautiful feet. What is beautiful feet? We take the gospel. When the message of change, we tell people the good news. That's the beautiful feet. Because when you bring good news to people, you have beautiful feet. Okay? So Christians all must have beautiful feet. Ah, uh, not smelly feet. Okay? Ah. Uh. Okay, the other time feet mentioned is in the armor of God. Shoes fitted or feet fitted with the readiness or you wear the shoes of the gospel of peace. There was a, this is a part of the Christmas story. There was a prophet, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. Now, she's an old lady about in the 80s. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. So when she was young, her, 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 her husband died. And then she was a widow until she was 84. And she never left the temple worship night and day. She's a worshipper. If you look for a good example of worshipper, Anna was a worshipper. She devoted her life entirely to worship. But when Jesus, as a baby, the uh, parents brought him to the temple, what did she do? She gave thanks to God. She spoke about the child to all. The worshipper became an evangelist. I tell you, friends, there's, there's, this is a wrong idea of worship. Some people think, oh, I'm, uh, I'm the, I will worship God. You be the evangelist. I, I, God called me to be a worshiper. God didn't call me to be a evangelist. He called you to be an evangelist. I will tell you, friends, a true worshiper. If you touch the heart of God, that's what we want to do when we worship, is to touch the heart of God. What do you see when you touch the heart of God? It's love for people. And how can you touch the heart of God and not go? Because that's the heart of God. Jesus says, a hundred sheep, 99 he found, one missing, he went to look for the one. I don't know how many percent of Fijians are in church this morning. I don't know how many percent. 10 percent? 20 percent? 30 percent? If it's 30 percent, let me say this. What would the good shepherd do? If only three or if only 30 sheep is found, 70 is missing. It is, I don't know, sound sacrilegious, but I say Jesus is not in the church. You can be here singing all the songs, 
Jesus is out there looking for people. And true worship means we will go. Okay, I, I want to tell you this story. You know, in Genesis 11, uh, there was a scattering. Because the people were so proud. They said, we can handle this. They built a tower of Babel. When they reached heaven, God came down, confused everybody. That was a very strange thing. I can just imagine Jesus saying to God at that time, God, Father, you want to do this? Uh? So many languages. You're going to make life hell for missionaries in the future. You know? But, in, but this is the whole point. In Genesis 11, there's a spreading. Everybody go to all the corners of the earth. Since that time, the key was in gathering. Because this is how the story of the world will end. One day, people from every, every ethnic group, every tribe, every language, will be all in one place, worshipping God. And how is that going to ha happen? Because people will go. People of God will go and gather. So this story of the history of the world is a story about gathering. God is doing the gathering. If you worship God, if you want to worship God, God say, who will go for us? That's the consuming passion of God. One day, that we will all be in the great worship meeting where we truly worship God with men and women from every tribe and language and people group. That's why you and I, we have to go. That's why in the heart of God is the going. And if you touch the heart of God with your worship, then you will go. Go therefore, Jesus says. And then, therefore, go. Okay, I want to... Uh, just tell you, just since I'm the VP for Asia, just a little bit about Asia. Asia is very big. 60% of the world is there. And every country speaks its own language. Very complicated, very difficult. In fact, some countries speak so many different languages. Uh, you, you may not know, but in Nepal, in, in the country of Nepal, there are 300 over people groups, different groups of people. All have their own language and culture. Right? The, the biggest is the Nepali group. That's why everybody speaks Nepal. Okay? But there are many groups. I don't know if Fiji also might have several groups. So we go. Then I take this opportunity. I say that I'm just a, in a way, I'm a missionary tourist because I don't stay, right? But people, God, people is calling, God is calling people to go and stay and minister and make sure there are churches planted so that eventually there'll be one group of people represented in the great worship meeting in heaven. Okay, this is uh, uh, me with a team from mainland China. Uh, this is uh, all the different people from mainland China. They, we have about six or seven teams that we are aware of. Uh, many we, don't, we are not even aware of okay, because that is a closed country. So I blanked off their faces so nobody get into trouble. Uh, this is the board of E Hong Kong that's, moves, uh, that's leading the ministry into mainland China. Pray for them. Times are dangerous nowadays. Uh, then this is Bangladesh, uh, the team in Bangladesh. And this one is, uh, oh, sorry, I miss, I think I missed, uh, I missed some people here. Oh, I, I passed, okay, never mind. Okay, I, want to, I wanted to show you this. This is, uh, this is in Chennai, Chennai, India. Uh, this is the tomb of uh, Doubting Thomas. Okay, he went to India. This is first, this is first century. He is a Jesus contemporary. Went there, and then he, uh, the tomb is there. Uh, the the, the, the statue is a statue there. The bones are buried below. So my, when I was in Chennai, my pastor friend took me there. So I just stood there at the tomb. And then I was just think, having some thoughts. Then I'm thinking, this fellow, I'm, I'm meeting him across, across 2,000 years difference of time. I say, this fellow came a long way. See? 
I'm from Malaysia. In a few hours, I will fly back to Kuala Lumpur and I'll be home. Then I thought he must have left Israel, left Jerusalem, must have taken him years to reach. Uh, maybe he stopped along the way or whatever, and he would never go back. They make me think about what happened to all the other apostles. What happened to this fella? He buried there, and then I found out as I did some research, apostles were all buried elsewhere. They were all seriously going, and they went, and they never came back. Peter's body is found in Rome. Andrew's body is found in Greece. John and Philip, they're buried in Ephesus, Turkey, today. Matthew. He's buried in Ethiopia. Matthias buried in Georgia. Simon the Salad buried in Armenia. Bartholomew buried in Azerbaijan. Thomas in Chennai. James the Lesser buried in Egypt. Don't you be buried in Fiji if you want to go, if you want to worship God. Uh, the, this, is the, this is the map. They put all the tombs of the apostles. I close with this, with this hymn. I don't know whether you, you know this song, this hymn. It's written about 150 years ago by a lady, Francis Habergale. She says, she says like this in worship, Take my life and let it be. Consecrated Lord to thee Take my moments and my days Let them flow in ceaseless praise Take my hands Every part of the body is to worship Take my hands and let them move At the impulse of thy love Take my feet and let them be Swift and beautiful for thee Take my voice and let me sing Always only for my King Take my lips and let them be Filled with messages from thee Take my silver and my gold. Not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall no longer be mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour. At his feet is treasure store. Take my life, take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee close with this verse Romans 12 therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies your bodies you see friends the time to worship God is now what you worship God with is your body your hands, your feet, your lips, your... Don't say, I'll worship God when I get to heaven. God, what can you do? Yeah, you can sing. But if God is only interested in music, the CD player or better music, God is interested in your heart, your feet, your lips, your hands. What is God saying to you? when you offer as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Let's bow our heads. Hallelujah. Father, I just bring my brothers and sisters before you. I thank you, Lord, you are God who loves us so much. You gave your one and only Son. I pray you help us this day, Lord, this morning, in response to your word, that we will offer our lives afresh to you and say, Lord, I will do whatever you ask. Dear friends, while eyes are closed and heads bowed, I want to pray for you. I want to ask God to do a special work. Maybe God this morning spoke to you, speaking to you. The Holy Spirit is telling you, I want, to, I want from you your life in worship. I want to pray for you. Would you just stand from where you are? And I, in closing, just before I pray, I want to pray for you. 
if you resp are responding to the word of God, I want to just pray for you and ask the Lord to bless you and help you to, uh, to really have a great fulfillment even as you worship Him. Would you just rise to your feet wherever you are? Don't, don't just rise if, if you don't mean it. But this morning, if you are serious with the word of God in response, you say, God, here's my life. Take it. I will do whatever you ask. Go wherever you want. Lord, I want to worship you. I want to be a true worshiper. Then you stand from where you are. And I, I want to really want to pray for you and ask God to do a work in your life. And I'm sure He will. But you need to respond. You need to say, God, here am I. Send me. Would you just do that quickly now? I'm going to pray. Father, this morning, thank you, Lord, for all those, Lord, who are responding to you. This day, Lord, and you see the hearts of everyone. I pray, Lord, you take what they're offering to you. And Lord, that you will take them, Lord, into, into great depths of relationship with you. The Lord, as they worship you, as they touch your heart, Lord, the Lord, they will have a greater love even for people, Lord. For those who do not yet know you, for those who are struggling, for those who are living their life apart from you, for those who are crying, for those who are seeking truth and seeking your purpose and will for their life. I pray, Lord, that you will bless my brothers and sisters, Lord, here and make them a blessing. And Lord, that they say, as they worship you, Lord, with their life, Lord, you will take what they're offering, Lord. You will take it and use it, Lord. So the Lord, they will be a real blessing, Lord, wherever they go. And send them, Lord, to, to minister to many different people, Lord, across, not only this island, but across many islands. Lord, that your, your name will be glorified as we honour you, as we bless you. Father, I just want to thank you for this church and for, Lord, your call to this church to worship you and, and to worship you in spirit and in truth. The Lord, that is a church, Lord, that will make the mark even in history, Lord. The men and women will arise from here and take your word and take your gospel, touch many nations, many lives, many hearts. Lord, we bless you. In Jesus' name, we worship you. Bless you, Lord. Hallelujah.